Thank you for auditing the always positive new music review show hosted by a French professor who's going to be reviewing the album The Record by Boy Genius. Boy Genius is, you know, it's a super group, right? A super group is when you take individual artists or individual members of a group and you combine them into a super group. The problem is super groups are, as a rule, pretty lame. They're usually pretty bad. The worst example, of course, is Traveling Wilburys, which is just an absolute garbage band filled with mega geniuses. But even on a sort of bigger level than that, often we'll have sort of celebrity jams, which really show the faulty premise of, hey, let's get everybody together. I mean, if you've ever watched a, a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame performance, they're all terrible. They're all the same, and they're all terrible. And, and it always feels like, like this scene from BoJack Horseman. Now, I don't edit my videos, so you just, <laughs> I'm not going to be able to edit this in like a professional YouTuber. So I'm just going to show this to you off of my, off of my, cam, off of my uh, computer here. So this is how usually it feels whenever there's a super group. Oh my God, Eric Clapton's playing with him? <gasps> Aaron Dessner? And his... Okay, th this, is, this is what it's like to me for the most part. Is that BoJack Horseman? Oh, geez, here we go. Mr. Peanut Butter and Bojack Horseman in the same room. What is this? A crossover episode? You know, that gets funnier every time. You're being sarcastic, but I think it does actually get funnier every time. So, to take that, uh, to take that metaphor out, you know, Mr. Peanut Butter, Phoebe Bridgers, and Lucy Dacus in the same room. What is this? A crossover episode? The thing is, I, I like all three of the members individually, right? I, I very very, very much like Lucy Dacus. I bought this album, I listen to this album all the time. If you don't own this album, you really need to buy it. Uh, I really like the Julian Baker album as well. I didn't end up buying that one. I didn't end up buying Phoebe D. Bridgers either. I'm sorry, I can't help it. I started calling her Phoebe D. Bridgers and I just do that. I, I'm gonna try to not say that, Phoebe Bridgers. I don't know why it makes more sense to me to say Phoebe D, but it just does. Um, I didn't end up buying those other two, but I liked them all. I listened to them, I reviewed them, and I thought they were great. And so when I heard that they had a super group, I just kind of said, oh, come on, how could it possibly be as good as the sum of its parts? So that's the, the general judgment call that I, as a, as a part-time music cricket, I'm going to try to make, sort of help myself work through this question. You know, am I going to buy this album? Am I going to buy the record by Boy Genius? Is it good enough? Or is it just Bojack Horseman? <laughs> what is this, a crossover episode? Sometimes, like, sometimes supergroups are good, you know? Led Zeppelin technically was a supergroup, and they were pretty good. Maybe like a decade ago, there was a Monsters of Folk, which is like Connor Oberst and Jim James, and they were pretty good. But I'm going to go as far as to say, Led Zeppelin aside, because I don't really consider them to be a supergroup in the proper sense, Boy Genius is probably the best supergroup I've ever heard. I, I think they actually are the sum of their parts. I think when they are, when it's a Lucy Dacus-led song, it's as good as a Lu Lucy Dacus song. When they are a Phoebe Bridgers song, they are as good as a Phoebe Bridgers song. And when they are a Julian Baker song, I think they're, they're better than what I remember Julian Baker being. Uh, Julian Baker just was a real surprise. I remember liking her album, but not loving it. And I loved every single time she was on this album. This album truly is the sum of its parts. And at time, it's even better. It has all of the emotional impact, the beautiful melodies, the singing, the instrumentation, the outrageously good lyrics all together. And it never feels like, can you believe we're doing this? Because that's the issue. That's the problem with the supergroup. The can you believe we're doing this? I, I want to make a, a quick little aside here that's actually thematically linked to Boy Genius as a band. I've talked about this before, but I need to say it again. I need to say it as much as possible. There's a, a famous scene from the Mike Douglas show in the 70s where John Lennon and Chuck Berry get together and do a celebrity jam. Can you believe... What is this, a crossover episode? The King of Rock and Roll and John Lennon working together? And they play together, and it's garbage. It's trash. It is the worst music you've ever heard. It's so bad. It's terrible. Okay, that's how, that's how bad it is. But you know what happens halfway through? It gets interesting. Yoko Ono jumps on the microphone and just starts... Aah! And it is great. <laughs> And everybody always uses this as an example of why Yoko Ono sucks. Uh, Yoko Ono did the only interesting thing in that performance. Because other than that, it's just, can you believe that they're in the same room together? Can you believe they're doing this? But of course, 
thanks to partially racism, most, mostly sexism, that is always used as an example of why Lo Yoko Ono is bad, why she, who probably is an artistic genius, is constantly used as the butt at the end of a joke. Why? Because, of course, we live under the stifling effects of a constant, omnipresent, invisible, and visible patriarchy. Which is what makes Boy Genius even more interesting to me, which is what makes their existence go beyond Bojack Horseman and Mr. Peanut Butter hanging around in the same room. It actually makes their entire existence an act of politics, a political feminist act, fighting against unstated, invisible misogyny. Their name, Boy Genius, is also maybe <laughs> the best name <laughs> that, you know, I don't think band names get better than Boy Genius because it communicates their, their sort of unstated goal. Now, now you're going to see behind me uh, a couple of, uh, three Boy Geniuses. Okay, you got Mozart, Boy Genius, Orson Welles, Boy Genius, and, and my father. He's up there. He, he, was the, he was the little Lord Fauntleroy Boy Genius of his family. I do want to mention one thing. You know, patriarchy hurts everybody. It helps nobody. It hurts everybody. It hurts some people more, obviously people who are not men, but it does hurt everybody. And all three of those people behind me were severely hurt by being boy geniuses, but it's important as we understand society what this term boy genius means. It's a term that exists for a reason. No intelligent and honest person can deny the fact that gender and race are social constructs. You, you fill the comments, and if you disagree with that, it means one of two things. One, you're unintelligent. Sorry, don't know what to tell you. Or B, you're dishonest. So either way, I don't really care. I can't lose in this little construct that I created. But that's true, okay? <laughs> Gender and race are constructed things. They're constructed by our society, right? So the, the existence of this term boy genius and the lack of the existence of the term girl genius is important because genius is a gendered word. Did you know that? Did you really think about that? If I ask you to rattle off geniuses, honestly, how many do you rattle off before you get to a woman's name? Now, of course, this is not that there is less human brilliance in the female brain or in the female body. It's in the societal constructs that created the societies that we have that gave my father that feeling of, in, of brilliance and excitement and put other people to the side that marginalized them. And it's so important because it never stops. It has never stopped. We've made a lot of progress in our society, but we have never actually succeeded in fighting this. And I could give you an example from my own life. Now, I was not a boy genius. <laughs> the script that was written for me was I was just kind of, I don't know. I was the youngest. I was just kind of a baby. That, that's fine. Um, but definitely, I, I have a daughter and a son, and I have worked as hard as I possibly can to not make the boy feel like the boy genius and the girl feel like the boy is the boy genius. Both of my children are incredibly intelligent. Both of them, I would, in my unbiased fatherly opinion, both of them are mega geniuses, okay? <laughs> that's, just, that's just how I feel about my own kids. I also have a baby now, a baby girl. I can't tell if she's a genius yet. She could, she could barely even drink water out of a straw. So we'll see, the, it, it's out there, you know? But I've seen it happen. I've seen the way that society has built my son up. I see the way that he has gotten that special genius boy juice at every turn. And I see how, whether it's extended family, teachers, any kind of just people on the street, like you just see it. It just keeps on happening. And the reason I'm talking about this is that Boy Genius is a great band and I'll get back to the music and I'll get back to the rocking and the rolling. But their very existence is so important <laughs> and their name is so important because it is such an important pushback. It really is three of the best songwriters and singers in the world all working together, making something that's this good and a reminder that genius is a gendered concept, but it is not a gendered phenomena, right? You know? I mean, in my own life, I'm smart, you know, that's like, like, like my thing, you know, but I'm married to a woman who's smarter than me. And I'm not saying that like uh, false modesty. <laughs> if you ever met her, you'd be like, wow, this guy, cool. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. It's crazy how smart she is, you know, but women are not socialized 
to be geniuses. So how great is it that this band that's so good is able to take this term, use it, manipulate it, push it back, while also making music that makes you want to nod your head? But it's even more important than that. Boy Genius, on a, and, and just so you know, I, I am a cis white male, all that, but I, I do also teach classes on, you know, on gender theory and stuff like that. If you, if you study uh, acad academics at a high level, especially French, you read Sixou, you read De Beauvoir, you know, you, you read, you do a lot of work uh, in feminist theory. And, and it goes beyond this. It goes beyond degendering the term genius. It also is that the band is based on female friendship. And that's another thing I can tell you. Raising a daughter, now raising two daughters, female friendships are treated like poison. <laughs> uh, relationships between girl, especially girls and then women is seen as being faulty from the start, incapable of being anything other than caddy uh, competition over some kind of fictional resource of men's affection and attention, right? That's, that's how it's treated. So the band is a political act in its existence, in its naming, in its approach, but also in its friendships. The way that they are, and you can see this in the videos and the way they sing together, is like true harmony. This is not uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, okay? Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young are like four, okay, three of the most beautiful voices plus the best voice of, of Neil Young. All these beautiful voices singing and harmonizing and behind the scenes, you know all of them are just waiting to stab each other in the back, pick each other's pockets and break off into a solo group. You know, this doesn't feel like that. This feels like true connection. And then on top of that, the fact that all of them are either, according to what I saw on Wikipedia or whatever, I could be wrong, I'm not here to judge or, or to assign uh, uh, sexual preferences, but as far as I can tell, both from their music and from what I read online, they are all either bisexual, pansexual, or lesbian, having that aspect of friendship as well. And this goes into a whole other area, <laughs> I'm telling you. This band's amazing. What's crazy is, as an academic, I can go on and on and on and tell you how important the band is, which I'm doing right now. And thank you for sticking with me. Smash the like bucket, subscribe, go to Patreon. But they're also good. <laughs> so it doesn't, it happens all the time in academics where like somebody who is like maybe intersectionally marginalized will write something and you'll just sit there and go, wow, I can't believe that a... Uh, 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 this, 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 and that wrote a book, and then you read the book, and you're like, hmm, it's okay. <laughs> it's not great, you know? That the music is that good. So let's sort of do the thing I really like to do, which is put myself in the crosshairs, okay? Um, I grew up cishet white male. I grew up totally ignorant of societal... I was, fairly, I was a little bit aware of societal racism only in the terms of black and white. I didn't understand like Catholic Protestant or inter-white or class. I didn't understand any of that stuff. And I definitely didn't pay any attention to gender. I didn't really analyze or the fact that I only liked male musicians or a certain subset of female musicians that were acceptable to a male audience. So PJ Harvey and Bjork, okay. Everything else, no. And the, the, even beyond that was it was subject of ridicule. And looking back at it now, I'm ashamed. You know, I'm in my 40s, right? mid 40s. So I can tell you, I grew up in the 90s when things were getting better. Everyone makes fun of the politically correct movement. It was important. It was good. It was a force for progress, long with political correctness. I mean that, I'm not joking. But still, I was growing up in that time, and I would make jokes about Lilith Fair, which was a all-female rock festival. You know, I, I would laugh at it because a lot of the singers were lesbians. And when I was younger, that was a source of comedy. Okay. And, and I was supposed to be one of the good ones. Sorry, if you hear some noises, my dog Bo is just moving his dog bed around. I can't stop him. Um, here, there he is. He's in the song. He's going to start chewing on his foot. You know, I was supposed to be one of the good ones. I considered myself a feminist, all that stuff, but still, you know, I would make Lilith Fair jokes. I would make jokes about Ani DeFranco, who was this, you know, really important uh, singer-songwriter of the 90s, who still annoys me a lot, you know, but, but I didn't understand the societal forces behind making fun of it. Part of what Boy Genius does that's so great is they're able to make music that is uncompromisingly feminine, uncompromisingly queer, uncompromisingly feminist, 
without pandering to a male audience, but still embraced by a male audience. Like how how do you how do you do that? I, I don't know. I, I don't know, but they each of them individually has done that, right? Each of them individually, you hear them and you don't ghettoize them in your mind. They have not been ghettoized into that is music for lesbians, that is music for women. Right? I don't know how they did it, but they did it. Maybe it's just because we're getting better as a society. Maybe. Maybe we should give ourselves a little bit of credit for growth as a society. I'm, I'm giving myself credit, you know? I hear this music and I don't, yeah, the first thing I don't think, I don't think the first time is, oh, this is a woman singing. I think, is this a good song? And that's taken me 40 years to get to that point. But still... Every time I hear one of these women singing about somebody and they use the pronoun you, I picture a man. I have to fight it. I have to fight it. That's that invisible hand of sexism, of, of, of societal, you know, of how we're socialized. Just, that's really just, if I'm going to get one more political note here. We just cannot underestimate how boys and girls are socialized differently. And that's the number one thing that I think we is the next step as we're working for trans rights is, is incorporating the fact that many um, people who transition to being female were socialized male and vice versa. And that the effects of that socialization need to be accounted for when we're thinking about how everybody interacts with each other. You know, I think it's the lack of, of taking that into consideration that we get into a lot of the real problems that we have on the left, where we're all theoretically working for the same thing of equality and truth, but then we just get broken into J.K. Rowling and Dave Chappelle, right? <laughs> right? So anyway, that's just a little side note. Uh, that I, that uh, that I'm obsessed with because I see it in my kids. You know, I I was a coach for my kids' Odyssey of the Mind. Odyssey of the Mind is this thing where kids are creative and they work together to solve problems and they per and they compete. And I saw how even though probably the smartest kids in the group were the girls, they would always take the back seat. They would always end up not being the leaders. They would always end up sort of doing the crafts. They would always sort of end up being, and it's not like any of the kids were bad. It's not like, I know, I, I like them all equally. They were all great. But you just see the socialization play itself out. Okay, it's 17 minutes in. I haven't talked about the music yet. Oh, I told you it was good. <laughs> so what, what, what do you want? Hey, boy genius, don't be so interesting <laughs> Don't be so interesting uh, to, uh, for feminist theory if you only want to be, you know, be treated as music. I will say, um, if I had a problem with this album, it's not the gender thing. There is a generational thing. So I looked it up, and all of them are sort of young millennials at the edge of millennials. And just the album cover with their three hands and their tattoos, it's, it's just this funny thing because, you know, I, I had kids 15 years ago, and now I have a baby now, and I already can see the other parents. All the other parents, all millennials, they all have tattoos. 100% of millennial parents have tattoos, you know? Start paying attention to car commercials. This is going to blow your mind. I just saw somebody with a tattoo in a car commercial last year for the first time. It's going to creep up and up and up and up as millennials age and get into car buying area. So like, I just sort of see these little markers. I think one of them has those spacers in their ears. You know, there's something kind of millennial-y about them, about the way they present themselves, about the way they talk. And this isn't even a criticism. This is just a division, a division which is probably harder for me to get over ultimately than any kind of gender division. The other issue I would have is that the only bad thing about this album, or no, when this album is good, it is spectacularly good with amazing lyrics, great singing, wonderful harmonies, all that. When it's bad, it's not bad, but it feels like a stylistic exercise. So even calling the album uh, the record, you know, even... Uh, how they, you know, they have a song that sounds like The Cure and they mention The Cure in the song. They have a song where they were inspired by Paul Simon and they thank Paul Simon in the liner notes. It has this sort of, sorry, my hair's all popping up over there. I'm just going to have to live with it. I'm just going to have to see that in the video and just say, that's fine. Tell me in the comments if that's fine, my hair being up like that. How do I get that back? Oh my God, I just made it worse. 
Oh, <laughs> now it's all you can look at. I'll, I'll just I'll do the whole video like this. So they, when it's at its worst, it's when it's at a stylistic exercise. Um, where it feels a little too self-conscious of like, what if we did that? And that ties into the general problem of supergroups, which is, can you believe we're all in the room together? But in general, I don't feel that way. Now I'm gonna give you my stamp, my example of the album, and it's a, it's a 15 minute stamp. If you really wanna understand this album, you have to watch the film. I'll include a link to it up there, above the banana, above the bananas, above my dad, Mozart, and Orson Welles. Uh, Cause this is the first three songs of the album, set to a music video directed by Kristen Stewart. So I'm gonna get into the beginning of the album because I really think the first four songs taken as a whole present the whole project of the album perfectly and then the rest of the album is just continuing to do that. The album begins with something that is not in that little video called Without You Without Them, which is just the three women singing a cappella, absolutely gorgeous, these themes of friendship and womanhood, speak to me until your history is no mystery to me, it's just gorgeous. It sets up this concept, this, this feeling that we're going to have for the whole video of these three women, these three friends working together. Then leads into the song $20. Uh, this is with, uh, so most of the songs have one of them taking the lead, which I think is good because then the other ones back up and it sort of feels more like, um, like working together on one of their songs as opposed to all getting together and trying to construct something. Uh, which I think can be sort of weak when you have such strong songwriters together. There's so, sort of like forced restrictor plates that they put on themselves when they're working exclusively together. So this first song is just awesome. You know, I think it's, I think I figured out on guitar, I was playing it for my baby the other day. Like, That's not it at all. I didn't figure it out. I'm embarrassed. I'm not as embarrassed as I am about that, but I'm embarrassed. Uh, it's something like that. It's something in D. I don't know. It's a really nice song. It's really upbeat. It's a great rock song. My my baby was really enjoying the song. We were listening to it in a little pit over there. Just all these little like tiny synth hits and these little quick harmonies. Like you listen to it, you just listen to it, and you just like get blown away by the production, just of their voices. Some of the best lyrics of this album. It was an all night drive from your house to Reno and, and T board in the graveyard where we play with fire in another life. We were arsonists. How long has the Chevy been on cinder blocks? The image that she's painting of this world where she is, where there's a Chevy on cinder blocks, you know, meaning the front of the yard, implying a lot of sort of like white trash history, in particular, sort of rural white trash. I guess it doesn't have to be white, it could be any sort of uh, rural poor having a car up on up on the cinder blocks. I apologize for the usage of ridiculously classist uh, terms. Feel free to dislike this video and call me a classist pig. I deserve it. Really cool instrumental bits here and the chorus is just so beautiful and there's this interplay between Baker's voice and then Dacus and then uh, and then Phoebe not Phoebe D, Phoebe Bridgers just kind of does this yelling. It's all three of them together. And then the next song is led by Phoebe Bridgers, Emily I'm Sorry, kind of a more acoustic song. They go back and forth to kind of rockers and folkers uh, all about a, she's asleep in the back seat. There's like this whole theme, like there was a, I think it was Adrian Lenker had this whole song about being asleep in the car. There's something about that vulnerability of sleeping in the car with somebody that today's musicians are finding and singing about a lot. It's cool, okay? That's a cool thing. Emily, I'm sorry, I just make it up as I go along, yet I can feel myself becoming someone only you could want. This is where I got into a little bit of trouble here because I started looking up the lyrics on Genius, which used to be called Rap Genius. And of course, rap is a terribly gendered space. I just taught a week in my class on hip hop about female rappers and um, so it's interesting because rap genius itself implies a certain gendered aspect. So the fact they just changed its name to genius is great. Nothing to say. Lauren Hill, Missy Elliott, probably even Nicki Minaj. Um, anyways, so I'm reading the, so like they have this whole backstory where like Phoebe Bridgers was in a polyamorous relationship with a dude and a woman named Emily and the guy was a bad guy. This is what I'm talking about with the millennial stuff, you know, like all that kind of polyamory stuff. That's all like people 10 to 15 years younger than me. I just thought that people my age weren't doing that, but they weren't really. I'm still enough of an old man to just be like, yeah, it doesn't work. 
No, it does work. Mm, it doesn't work. It does work. I know one person once who was happy for almost five years. I'm just, I'm an old man. I'm an old man. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I'm, my position, my anti-polyamory position is wrong and backwards. I still hold it. I still believe it. So I'm not going to lie to you. I am going to crack my voice. I, I think it's horse hockey and it can't possibly work for happy human relationships in the long term. But hey. Monogamy doesn't work in the long term for the most part either. So if you want to make the argument that monogamy doesn't work, that argument also holds water. I don't know. All I can tell you is it feels very millennial to talk about a polyamorous relationship that went south. But still, it doesn't matter because why did I even read that? Why? Did the biographical details add anything to this song? No. I can feel myself becoming someone only you could want. That kind of aching pain transcends the specific example, transcends lesbian relationships, transcends female relationships, is a complete expression of human doubt and insecurity. I can feel myself becoming someone only you could want. That is a lyric of the absolute top shelf quality. It expresses something which I've never heard expressed precisely like that, despite the fact the words that are used are common words. Don't even get a lot of words, except for the word want. None of those get a lot of points in Scrabble, okay? I feel myself becoming someone only you could want? Like, oh my God, not only you could love, but only you could want and you're becoming this way and how do you get that way? This is what I'm talking about. I, as much as I'm sort of interested in the actual details and the sort of homo à clé, you know, you can like unlock the book, unlock the story and find out, oh, Phoebe was with this guy and then Lucy was dating this lady and it didn't. No, this is, this is transcendent art. Art that transcends whoever these three women are. Then we get to the final part of this opening trilogy. I guess it's a quadrilogy. So the first song sets them all together. So that's how we get set up. And then they each get one song. And this is True Blue um, by Lucy Dacus. My name is Lucy Dacus. When the moon hits your eyes. Lucy Dacus, I would argue, is maybe the best storyteller in music right now. Okay. Okay. Calm down. Calm down, Swifties. Swifties, calm down. Swifties, chill out. I think she is. I think so. She tells amazing stories. Amaze, like the v <laughs> VBS on the, have you heard VBS off this album? <laughs> oh my God. I am not a millennial who grew up going to vac vacation Bible school. I'm not a woman. I'm not a girl. I'm not any of those things, but that song hits me so hard. She's so good at telling stories at including the right details to give you a full picture. <sighs> Actually reminds me a little bit of, of Pedro the Lion. That, that album I really liked a lot, uh, the Phoenix album, uh, in, sort of in that style. Um, but again, great lyrics, even funny lyrics. <laughs> when you don't know who you are, you fuck around and find out. So, you know, fuck around and find out is an expression which has only become popular in the last five years. I never heard it before, but it's very useful. You know, that like uh, getting in trouble by being too... It's basically curiosity killed the cat, but it's more like keep goofing around and I'll mess with you. I remember my oldest brother who watches a lot of my videos, so uh, yeah, I don't think I'll mind me telling the story. He used to have this thing where he was the oldest by a bunch, uh, by, by many years. <laughs> And, you know, younger brothers try to annoy their older brothers. So, you know, sometimes, you know, you just try to like, flick him on the ear, flick him on the ear. And what he would say is, you could do that two more times, but on the third time, I will hit you as hard as I possibly can. Guess you didn't do it twice. <laughs> I didn't get to the third. I just took that very seriously. I don't know. I learned something from that. Uh, and he really discouraged the fucking around and finding out part. He told me right up front. Uh, and it feels so good to be known so well. I can't hide you like I hide from myself. Again, more great lyrics. What's great is that like, how well does that go with Phoebe Bridger's song about Emily, I'm sorry, and I feel myself becoming someone only you could want. Like these are three women with presumably very different life experiences uh, who managed to sort of communicate these similar spaces in relationships and in love and in life. It feels so good to be known so well. I can't hide from you like I hide from myself. It's almost like she could be the Emily that is being sung about in Emily, I'm sorry. Which I doubt she is. So all three of these songs come together and they're all put together in that movie by Kristen Stewart. Hey, Kristen Stewart. <laughs> um, Kristen Stewart, j just the name... 
the name Kristen Stewart, the person Kristen Stewart, the actress, the director, Kristen Stewart is everything that Boy Genius is talking about. She is. She is a wonderful actress or actor, depending on how you prefer to be called, right? Some actresses prefer to be called actors. I, I don't really care. Either way. She's amazing at the craft of acting. Did you see Spencer? <laughs> okay. An amazing, amazing actor. But she will never outgrow the hate that she received for being a female character in a series of movies whose audience was female girls, was te female teenagers. American society, the world society, will never forgive anybody, ever, whose primary audience is teenage girls. Unless it's Harry Styles or Justin Timberlake, in which case, you can grow up and be whatever you want, Buster. Look at you go. It's so forward, so wonderful, right? The, the, just think about the way that Robert Pattinson has this career and is loved and taken seriously and he's Batman and he's Lighthouse and think about how Kristen Stewart has had to fight so much harder to be taken seriously is still not taken seriously is never forgiven for doing that when she was 15 years old in a movie I've seen those movies they're not good movies but she's not the problem with those movies they're not particularly well written or directed <laughs> okay She's not the problem with those movies. And of course, uh, I believe she's out as a lesbian, or at least as bisexual, which is a whole nother thing, which makes this whole movie, this is so great because it's, it's these three great songs by these three great musicians. Great. But it's also a great movie. It's a great series of movies by a great director. And again, putting on my academic hat, this is a great work of queer cinema. It is. It's a great work of queer cinema and around themes of female friendships and perseverance. Starts off with that $20 song, the, the, the Julian uh, ba uh, Baker song, and he's like waking up and she like starts a fire and there's like, she's sleeping in one of those race car beds and race cars are very gendered towards male, towards boys. And who doesn't want a race car bed? I want a race car bed. I always wanted Ricky Shorter's bed. I never got it. Doesn't matter. I can move on. Uh, but And then the images of the monster truck posters on the wall. It's these kind of ideas of what girls are allowed to be and not allowed to be. And then there's these three girls who are supposed to represent the singers of the band. And they're running and there's fire. And there's the themes of the pyromaniacs. Then we get to the next song. And each one is inter has a little cut with these three little windows where you see the three singers, the three actresses, three actors, uh, you know, sort of being kind of fuzzy and behind move on to the ballad with Phoebe Bridgers and this amazing scene of her just singing and just in a t-shirt and these little stripy pajamas which is weird because those are the same pajamas that like my kids wear stripy shorts as pajamas I don't is this a thing I don't know I don't know and you know she's singing in front of all these monster trucks behind her and that same bed that was in the first song is now in the pile of things that the monster trucks are dropping over which implies you know the loss of innocence and she's singing this song and these lyrics you know I'm 27 and I don't know who I am all these lyrics of growing up and trying to figure out nice interchange between sort of vintage film and and not vintage uh, film stock I watched this with my daughter, my teenage daughter. Uh, she said that was the part that she liked. She loved this, by the way. God damn. This whole video. She was just like, this is great. This is great. I didn't tell her it's done by Kristen Stewart. And at the end, she's like, that was by Kristen Stewart. You know, this is a, this, there's a representation matters, okay? So uh, a 15-year-old teenage girl seeing this as a thing, as opposed to, I don't know, I don't know, Melanie Martinez, you know, like people who are more focused on on sort of creating a pop brand as opposed to just sort of creating art and being artists. It's nice. No, no, no shade on Melanie Martinez, though. I liked her last album, and I might review her new one. Uh, then we get to the to the final track, which is uh, Dacus's and called True Blue, and they're just kind of painting together, doing sort of home renovation, and just they're all, three of them are all together, and then at a certain point... Spoilers, Lucy and Phoebe just start making out. And this is like, you know, this is one of those things. You know, this is one of those beautiful things where women allow themselves to be more fluid in their sexuality. There's a societal construct, patriarchy hurts everybody, and I have never French kissed any of my friends. Not once. I probably should have. There's one time, I was hanging around with a friend of mine, hanging in a hot tub. We should have made out. We should have. We, we would have been fine. We would have been fine. We, then I would have... Uh, hey, have you ever made out with a dude? Yeah. 
once, but I, but I don't, I don't. I don't because if I did, everything blows up. Then I'm in a box, I'm in a box, I'm in a box, I'm gay, I'm in the gay box. Professor Sky, gay box, there you go. Let me out, okay? That's what it was like. That's kind of what it still is like. So this like friendship that turns into, not it's not an orgy, it's not sexual. The way they're kissing isn't even sexual, it's just sensual. It's like this sensual friendship that like feeds into the music. And it makes me like want to watch a video where, I don't know, Robert Plant and Jimmy Page start kissing, but not, but not in the like fanfic way. <laughs> you know, not like whatever, Snape kissing Dumbledore or whatever it is. Oh, stop snoring, bud. You know, like, but just more just in this sort of like extension of the sensuality and the vi vivacious liveliness of the music. Uh, that friend of mine, by the way, uh, we aren't friends anymore. Not because, not because... <laughs> Not because we uh, we almost kissed. I don't think we actually came that close to kissing. Uh, he, he never forgave me for getting married. So, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? It sucks. Friendships are tough. Another thing about this album is a lot of, a lot of it's about friendship. And uh, all, all these women are in their mid-20s. And mid-20s is where friendships go to die, <laughs> you know? Early 20s, mid-20s, everything's great. Early 30s, I don't know. Mid-40s, I got no friends. I got my family, I got no friends. Uh, next song is Cool About It. This is where we get back to sort of all of them working together. This is the song where they're very clearly influenced by The Boxer, by Paul Simon, and they mention it and kind of even borrow from it. They might even give him songwriting credit. I don't know. Acoustic guitar. This is the low point on the album for me. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Every time I say that, every album, someone says, how can you possibly say that's your least favorite song? Let me tell you why. It's that stylistic thing I was talking about. They all follow the same format. They all sing a similar chorus with different words. It feels like an exercise. Now, fortunately, the melody is so good and the singing so good, who cares? The worst song in this album is better than most songs that came out this week. So there we go. Next song is called Not Strong Enough. This is that song where it felt like The Cure in the beginning. Like the way the guitar sounded, the way the synthesizers were in the back, and then later on in the song, someone says they're listening to Boys Don't Cry. Again, it's that stylistic thing, but it's just so good. And then the lyrics are strong enough, I'm not strong enough to be your man, and I'm like, hey, I grew up in the 90s. I remember Are You Strong Enough to Be My Man by Sheryl Crow. Sheryl Crow, who I saw open up for the Rolling Stones. Sheryl Crow, who I never in my entire life ever thought of as anything other than an industry plant because I was a sexist piece of garbage okay I was a sexist piece of garbage I never took her music seriously for even one second I saw her I saw that she was attractive and I just assumed that she never did a single thing that was original and was not written by some 50 year old dude in an office somewhere in West LA I think I'm wrong <laughs> I think she's a great artist I don't know I, I don't know I'm thinking back on all of her singles. They're all good. They're all good. I just didn't take her seriously because the whole patriarchy thing, which hurts everybody but hurts some people more than others, it just made it that I just never took her seriously. But I remember this song. So it's interesting because the question is a, a woman asking, are you strong enough to be my man? That song also used to really intimidate me when I was younger. But then this song is, I am not strong enough to be your man. And there's a lot of play about that, about these uh, women referring to themselves as boys or as men. Um, and this, in a better world, this song would be a hit. In a better world, you'd be at Trader Joe's uh, pushing your cart down and this song would come on. Unfortunately, middle of the road rock hits can't exist anymore. And this, like Sheryl Crow, would be a great middle-of-the-road rock hit. The kind of song that comes on the radio and you like it. But we don't have space for that. I said it was middle-of-the-road. And then you get to the ending, this outro bridge, where they come back to their central principle about the dangers of patriarchy and the ways that women and girls are socialized differently, socialized in ways to marginalize themselves, to discredit themselves, to not see themselves as great. Always an angel, never a god. I never thought of this, but no, <laughs> I can't think of any woman who ever uh, in, in, in media or in life who would call themselves a god. 
there, women are allowed and called angels, but never called God. Okay, Kanye West told you who he thinks he is. He's a God, okay? He said that. Missy Elliott never said that. Nicki Minaj never said that. So, always an angel, never a God. Beautiful. It, it is a perfect continuation of the thesis of the band itself. Sorry, speaking of, of wonderful queer couples over there, Bo and Toby are just chilling out. They cuddle together. They love, they, oops, sorry. They love each other. It's beautiful. They're just, they're, just, they're just great. Next song is called Revolution Number Zero. Uh, this is a Phoebe Bridgers one. This is obviously a Beatles reference uh, to Revolution One and Revolution Nine. Um, I sort of wish that it was a little bit more like Revolution Number Nine. <laughs> like I, I sort of wish it was kind of in, a little bit more avant-garde, a little bit more challenging. Um, but it's more just a kind of nice haunting so song with acoustic guitars. I do like how it's about an imaginary friend. She starts off with the word imagine. I think that's on purpose to connect you to John Lennon. So John Lennon wrote Imagine Number Nine. I mean, wrote Revolution Number Nine and Revolution. And so saying imagine every friend. Um, girls have imaginary friends more often than boys do. Uh, it's a thing that I think a lot of girls have to cope with loneliness and feeling less than in society. I don't know. My son never had an imaginary friend. My daughter did. That's anecdotal. <laughs> That's the definition of anecdotal. Um, but there you go. What was her name? I think it was Sarah. Yep, Sarah. Sarah was the imaginary friend. I think she was nice, too. It was good. Um, but it takes an interesting turn. Bo, Bo, please stop licking your foot. Thank you. Um, it, it starts off with like this idea of like the imaginary friend has a broken nose and going to go kick their teeth in. And I don't know, that's kind of interesting, like turning this imaginary friend into a real person. Nice kind of mandolin at the end, some backward sounds. I, I really sort of wish that they went for it like a little bit more in the abstract realm, but it's fine. Next song is called Leonard Cohen. Remember how I said Lucy Dacus is probably the best storyteller in music? Example number two. This song. This is a song about being in a car and somebody tells you, you have to listen to this song. You just, just, shh. And she's being so respectful that they go the wrong way in the highway and they don't even tell. This is such a relatable moment. How many times... Have you been in a room and someone's like, shh, you've got to listen to this song. You have to listen to this song. I'll give you a few examples in my life. One, I sit people down and make them listen to the entirety of Funky Drummer by James Brown. That's a thing I do. I, I, I make people sit in a room and not say a single word and listen to the song Funky Drummer by James Brown. That's what I do. Uh, Round Here by Counting Crows. I remember when my friends made me listen to that song. <laughs> And I already hated them because uh, Mr. Jones was a big hit. Round here. I remember we were driving by Wellington Elementary School in Belmont, Massachusetts. I, I remember where I was. And then there's about 85 other times that I have been sat in a room and someone told me, shh, you just have to listen to this. And do you know who the person was that was singing when I was told, shh, you just have to listen just listen. Just listen to the words. Just listen. Just listen. It's going to change your life. It's so beautiful. <laughs> it's always Leonard Cohen. <laughs> Seriously. I, I only bought this album two years ago. I only intentionally lis listened to Leonard Cohen like uh, two years ago because he was always inflicted on me. Men, women, it doesn't matter who, everybody. No, listen, no, listen. Even Hallelujah, performed by Jeff Buckley, before it was a popular song, someone made me listen to it. It's always Leonard Cohen. So I love the fact that it's called Leonard Cohen. I like to imagine that that's the song that they're singing about, that they're singing about having to sit down and listen to Leonard Cohen. There is a reference to a specific Leonard Cohen song later, which I'll get to later. But, you know, it's just this achingly intimate and true, true true kind of story. The amount of times this has happened in my life, mostly with Leonard Cohen, sometimes with other people. Um, I like it too because 
this creates extra time for them to talk. And this is another one of Lucy Dacus's just shut up lyrics that are so good. I might like you less now that you know me so well. Ah. <laughs> I might like you less now that you know me so well. It's an inversion of your expectation. The, the idea is that you like someone else less the more you know them. But here, it's you like someone else the more they know you. The pain, the vulnerability. That's, that's the problem. And it ties in with the earlier song. Now, I, all my lyric sheets are all over the place. Uh, earlier, the other one, it feels good to be known so well, you know, on, uh, on True Blue. True Blue, you know? Like, it feels so good to be known so well, uh, I might like you less now that you know me so well. It's good to be known so well, and it hurts to be known so well. She also references the song by Leonard Cohen that talks about how cracks are the ways that light gets in. I, I cannot, I do not have the power to manifest these connections. These connections just exist. And all you can do is say, hey, if the same thing happens twice in one week, that means there's a zeitgeist going on here. Lana Del Rey has an entire song called Kitsugi, which is about how the cracks let the light in in pottery. So we have two separate millennial music albums, female millennial music albums, talking about... One second. Bo, would you stop it on the foot? Bo, stop. Stop. It's a very unsettling sound for my listeners. He's like... Very unpleasant. Two separate female-led albums in the span of one week around the theme of the cracks or how the lights get in. So I'm thinking about my daughter, when I'm thinking about people who are listening to this music at the point in their life where the music seeps into their soul and helps them to process existence, right? When music is at its best. It can still happen like that when you're older, but it happens less often, okay? And it's a lot harder <laughs> to, to get those feelings. We have two of these great musicians talking about the same theme about healing and about the imperfections allowing the light in. This is like this crazy moment that we're living in that's being around this theme of the cracks, the imperfection is how the light gets in, the value in being imperfect, the value in being broken and putting yourself back together again. This is therapy. This is like everything that I want Everything that I want my daughter to understand about existence and about difficulties and about failure and about pain, it's all coming together in these two different songs from artists who I imagine they don't hang out together. I don't know. I'm, it doesn't seem like Lana Del Rey is probably super fun to hang out with. She's probably too famous. She's probably been too just warped by, by superstardom. Who knows? I don't know. What do I know? I don't know anything. I imagine they don't hang out. But here they are making the same song. Very cool. Next song uh, is another Baker song uh, with more kind of interjections by uh, Phoebe Bridgers. The guitar here is very sort of 90s-ish. Sort of reminds me of like, I think like Train? <laughs> a little bit of Weezer, a little bit of Pixies, very sort of wave of mutilation guitars uh, in the post-chorus. Um, nice lyrics about being sort of a banal revolutionary. I imagine if you are a young woman who travels in a lot of circles of sort of artsy, fartsy people. You deal with a lot of fake revolutionaries. Um, this is a great example of how I'm learning to really love uh, um, uh, Baker's music. Julian, I might have called her by a different name, which was the name of a friend of mine I knew in LA uh, when I lived there. Sorry about that. Um, so like really this like, there's something about her rock presence on this album that really hits me the right way. It really feels like the best sort of rock bit. I, maybe the other two are maybe better at sort of like singer-songwriter stuff. Uh, maybe better more at the kind of folky acoustic stuff. But I, I, man, I really, really like that. Next song is We Are In Love, very acoustic somber, Dacus track. Um, 
I am the boy. Would you love me if I turns out I'm insane? Uh, this one's fine, but I didn't. It didn't really feel it. And then we get into anti curse, and maybe I just like the rockers more on here. Cool, nice high voice and thumping bass, and it's a story apparently where she almost drowned. Again, I read Genius on this by mistake. <laughs> Uh, just great drumming, straightforward rock. She almost drowned and thought about how it's actually not a bad way to die, being drowned around your friends. Speaking of, uh, of, of Jeff Buckley. And just, the, she has this ability to have intimacy and honesty in her voice while also really, really rocking. And that's a hard skill. Final track is Letter to an Old Poet. This is primarily a Phoebe Bridger song, but all of them join. Kind of a super mellow outro. I really like, I don't know, like, I, this is a really bitter song. You're not special, you're evil. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna, <laughs> okay. I'm gonna read these lyrics, not with the uh, godlike voice of Phoebe Bridgers. Notice I didn't say angelic, the godlike voice of Phoebe Bridgers. Uh, I'm gonna read this, like, harshly. And just see how harsh these lyrics are. You're not special. You're evil. You don't get to tell me to calm down. You make me feel like an equal, but I'm better than you. And you should know that by now. When you fell down the stairs, it looked like it hurt. <laughs> I was not sorry. I should have left you right there with your hostages, my heart, and my car keys. You don't know me. Anyways. Uh, kind of a downbeat outro. I sort of wish that they ended with a a like a little tag, like the opening one with all three of them together. But maybe it's more tasteful that they didn't. You know, maybe they didn't force it. Maybe I'm criticizing them for doing things too intentionally or or too stylistically on purpose, and and then I'm now criticizing them for not doing the same thing. So these are my patreons. Um, not only am I going to buy this album, my daughter loves this album. I'm going to go try and see them in concert. They're playing in Toronto this summer. So I'm going to try to go um, and take my daughter because she's like, Dad, my birthday's not for a little while, but if you want to get me tickets for my birthday, I'd really love it. So, you know, I'll probably just, you know, you know, summer. Um, a couple of these Patreons on Patreon, I, I tell I tell people that I will give them an individual shout out. It doesn't matter if you're on the EP list or the box set list. I'll give him a shout out. So Claudio West and Paul Grobe. I don't know if that's like German and supposed to be Paul Grosse, but Grobe, G-R-O-B-B-E. The should be there somewhere. Where are you? There you are. Anyways, they want a special shout out because they really like this album. So there's my review. Oh, what did you what did you think? Did you smash like bucket? Are you still watching? Uh, Toby ended up moving away. He's over there now. And Bo is, Bo is happily snoring. Just chilling out. All right. Until next time, fight the, fight the patriarchy, and there's the camera. <laughs>